Okay, so let's develop a Calvinist epistemology, okay? And, and I get a lot of this um, from David Garner in uh, his lectures at Westminster Theological Seminary. Um, we have epistemological problems. We have epistemological problems. Now, all, everyone is saying that. Everyone we talked to so far in this class, um, the people, the dead people, uh, are all saying this, right? They're all saying we have epistemological problems. Um, the key is to get the right problems. The key is to get the right problems. Uh, there's two kinds of problems that we have um, with a Calvinist epistemology. Um, the first is problems sourced in God. I'm a bit coy when I say that, as if God has problems. They're problems from our perspective, okay? Not problems from God's perspective. Problems sourced in God. Um, and that's twofold. One is God's transcendence. God's transcendence. God's transcendent. Um, he doesn't dwell in time. He dwells in eternity, right? Um, he, he is beyond us. He, he is... Uh, he uh, exists in heaven and in the highest heaven, right? That's where God is. Um, so that's problem number one. Problem number two is God's incomprehensibility. So that even if we were to know something of God, because God is infinite, we cannot know God fully, right? Even if God is known, he cannot be known fully. We are finite creatures, we are finite creatures, and God is incomprehensible. We are finite creatures, and God is transcendent. So those are two problems sourced, sourced in God. Um, problems sourced in us is the second category. Okay? So one is problems sourced in God. Uh, two is problems sourced in us. So number one would be our finiteness. Our finiteness. So our problem, this is what we said before, our problem is first ontological. Our problem is first ontological and not moral. Our biggest problem has to do with the creator-creature distinction and not with the fact that we're sinners, foundationally, right? How do we know this? Genesis chapter 2. God had to speak to Adam and say, name all the animals. Adam couldn't figure that out on his own. God had to speak to Adam in the garden. We are finite by design. Consider Acts 17, 28. In him we live and we move and we have our being. In him we live and we move and we have our being. And this is this is part of what it means to be human. How do I know this? Look at the example of Jesus. Jesus, Luke 2, 52. Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. Jesus grew. Jesus grew in his understanding of who God is. Right? He grew in wisdom. Right? That means, apart from sin... Jesus never sinned. Apart from sin, we would still need to grow. We would still need to learn things, right? Or consider Hebrews 5 verse 8. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. Jesus grew and Jesus learned, which means you can have a human, you can have a human with no sin who needs to grow and needs to learn, okay? Those limitations, those limitations are not the problem. Those limitations are part of what it means to be a creature and not a creator. So therefore, finiteness is part of the human condition and not a result of sin. Had Adam never sinned, he would still need to grow in his knowledge of God. He would still need God to reveal himself. So if we are finite, then how can we have true conclusions about God, right? If we're finite, how can we have true conclusions about God? If God is wholly different from us, right? We talked about the creator-creature distinction. There's God and there's us. We are not God. God is not us. That's the foundation of Christian theology. 
How can we come to true conclusions? We cannot come to true conclusions about God than simply with rational thoughts. Right? How do we think rightly about something we have no experience of? Apart from revelation. That is the answer, alluding to it. Um, but we have something more than that. It, the problem is compounded with sin. It's compounded with sin. Sin has corrupted our thinking and our feeling, our thoughts and our affections. We don't want to think rightly about God, and we don't want to feel rightly about God. As was mentioned earlier, let's look at Romans 1, starting in verse 18. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. You don't know this yet, but this is a this is a active participle. This is an active participle that's being used here. And the active voice, the active voice in contrast to a passive voice, is something that's intentionally being done. Okay, picture this. If you go to a pool and you have a soccer ball, football with you, right? If you want it to stay under the water, you have to keep pushing it under the water. It wants to come up, but you're pushing it down. That's what's happening here. People are actively suppressing the truth. They're taking the football and they're pushing it under the water, even though it's trying to come up. Truth about God, knowledge about God is trying to come up, but people are suppressing it. Because, verse 19, what can be known about God is plain to them. It's obvious. Because God's shown it to them. This is all people. Where has he shown it? His invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that are made. Right, so the problem then, the problem is not that God's not revealing. The problem is that when God reveals who he is, people don't want it. People are suppressing it. So you're, people are without excuse. Everyone's without excuse. Because what can be known about God is obvious. So sin has made it so we don't want to think rightly about God. And sin has even corrupted our intellect. Romans 8, verse 5. Sorry, Romans 8, verse 7. The mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. So not only, the, the picture gets even more bleak. Not only are people intentionally suppressing the truth, this text would say they're unable to not intentionally suppress the truth. They will always do that. Because they are only able to do that. Theologians call this the noetic effects of sin. The effects of sin on our mind, our intellect, our thinking. We hate God. That's the point. So that's first, is our, our problem sourced in us, our finiteness and our sin. Therefore, okay, therefore, our theology must be sourced in God. Right? Theology must be sourced in God, not in us. Theology is not sociology. Theology is not a study of religion. Theology is not a reflection on human feelings. Theology is not a reflection on how different communities have expressed feelings of ultimate dependence. Theology is not asking, <coughs> what does this group of people and this group of people and this group of people think about God? It can't be. Bavink says this, in the Apostles' Creed, for example, we cannot exchange I experience for I believe. Right? We cannot exchange I experience for I believe. The truth of historic Christianity cannot rest on experience as its ultimate ground. It must be rest and something we can put our confidence in. Theology is not grounded or sourced in us then. It's grounded and sourced in God. Okay? Therefore, theology that's not sourced in God is idolatrous. 
it, to make conclusions about God apart from God uh, is, is factoring our own gods. It's creating our own gods, assuming that we can learn about God from human society rather than divine revelation is the same as Israel looking to the gods of Canaan. It's no different. It's looking somewhere other than God for sources of information and sources of knowledge of who God is. This should produce in us great humility. Right? Because all four of these answers, all four of these statements, right? Problem source in God, problem source in us, therefore theology must be sourced in God, and therefore theology that's not sourced in God is idolatry. They leave us wholly unable to come to right conclusions about who God is on our own unless God does something. God has to do something. And if God doesn't do something, we are here, and He is here. He has to do something. And, and, and any knowledge of who God is must come because God condescends to us. And as we read the Bible, do you know what else should motivate humility? Do you know why God does choose to reveal? Because He's kind. And he's gracious. And he's good. He, he did not find it content within himself to stay locked up in heaven somewhere. He wanted to reveal to us. And when he does, do you know what he does reveal? The greatest possible thing. He reveals himself. So, so with that then, with that then, God must be self-interpreter. God must be self-interpreter, okay? If God is the standard by which all things are measured and which all evidence is weighed, that puts God in the position of evaluator and us in the position of listener. That puts God in the position of to use Genesis 1 language, the namer, right? He names Adam. He, he has the right to call things what they are. He, he calls the Sabbath day holy, and it's holy. He, he commissions the man, and the man is sent out with the woman alongside him. I remember one time I had a friend who... We were, he had objections to the idea that God was sovereign. He had idea, objections to the idea that God was sovereign. And so do you know what I did? I went to Romans 9 with him. And we were reading through Romans 9. And do you know what he said at the end of it? He had no objection to my exegesis. He had no objection to, to the way I was interpreting the text. He said, God isn't like that. The God I worship isn't like that. If God is like that, he's not worthy of my worship. He's not objecting to me. He's objecting to the text. God is self-interpreter. God tells us who he is. We have no right to think that God is someone other than who he's revealed himself to be. Anything else is worshiping a false god, one of our own creation. God is who he says he is, and we must believe that. What if God is different than you thought? What, what if God reveals himself to be different than who you thought that he was? Our only response in that moment must be, I was wrong. God is who his word says that he is. So our, our position, our position is we are unable to verify and we are unable to argue. We must only accept through faith. Consider Job 40, 1 through 5. 
The Lord said to Job, Shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? He who argues with God, let him answer. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay hand on my mouth. I've spoken once, I will not answer. Twice, but will proceed no more. Abraham Kuyper helpfully says this, In his entire theology, the theologian must stand in the presence of God as his God. As soon as, for a moment, he looks away from the living God to engage himself in an idea about God over which he will sit as judge, he's lost. The object of his knowledge has already vanished from his view. He will not understand God by looking away from him. You cannot expect to kneel in prayer before God as a worshiper in any way other, in any way except as dependent upon him. So also as theologian, you can never receive true knowledge of God when you refuse to receive your knowledge from him in absolute dependence of him. Right? We, we need God. Theology must be sourced in God. The alternative, we've already seen it. So then, those are the problems. Here are the answers, okay? Here are the answers that a Calvinist epistemology gives. So answer one. Answer one is God, the all-knowing. Okay, God knows everything. God knows everything. He never learns anything. He knows everything. And we can only know something with certainty, as I said before. We can only know something with certainty if we know everything or if we know someone who does know everything. Okay? We theologize because God is theologized first. We theologize because God is theologized first. God, then, is both the subject of theology and the object of theology. God does theology before us, and he is the one we study in theology. That's answer number one. Answer number two is God the speaker. God the speaker. John 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. God is a speaking God. In fact, when He reveals Himself, He reveals Himself as Word. That means He reveals Himself as a speaker. Consider even John 17, as Jesus, God the Son, is praying to God the Father, how does he pray? He prays with language. He prays with words, right? How do the members of the Trinity talk to one another? With words. The members of the Trinity, then, do not speak to one another with feelings or thoughts or even experiences of each other. No, if we look at John 17, Jesus looks to heaven and speaks words to the Father. Father, the hour has come. Glorify the Son that the Son may glorify you. They, in eternity past, the members of the Trinity were speaking to each other in language. They were speaking to each other in language. That means, here's what that means, language is not something that humans created. Oh, that's radically important for all of our theology. Language is sourced in God. Here, here's what that doesn't mean. That people were created with uh, and, uh, and grunts and groans and things like that, and slowly language evolved. And as God saw people speaking in language, he thought, oh, that looks like a good way to talk to them. No, no, no. The first words ever spoken in time were spoken by God himself. Let there be light. Language, then, isn't a property that God adds on to himself. No, our ability to speak in language is a property of us being made in the image of God. That's radically important. Because that means that language is an adequate means of God revealing. 
and experience is not superior to language. Even, even consider the throne room scene in heaven in Isaiah 6. In the, king, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, with two he flew. And one called, spoke to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. When we peek into heaven, the angels worship in language. What that means is, when we get to heaven, we, we, don't, we don't move past language into just ex sheer experience, as if sheer experience were somehow better than language. No, we will speak, and we will speak more clearly and more articulately, articulately than we ever have before. So then God, not knowledge of God, then God the speaking God, Knowledge of God is only possible as God reveals it, okay? It's only possible as God reveals it. Let's look at Matthew eleven twenty-seven. 27. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one, here's our epistemology language, no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Consider uh, John 15, verse 5, in light of this. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I am him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me... You can do nothing, not one moment of theologizing. You need God for all of it. And the good news is that when God speaks, He never lies. Titus 1 verse 2. In hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. Baving says this, The fact that the creature knows anything of God is solely due to God. He is knowable only because and insofar as he wants to be known. So God, the speaking God. Answer three. God the creator. God the creator. God's creation of the cosmos gives him the right to interpret the cosmos. He knows the proper place and the proper meaning of all things because he created them. So th this destroys the idea of subjective truth, the idea of my truth, even the idea of subjective beauty. What I find beautiful? No, 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 no. God created the world, so really... His interpretation of the world matters more than anyone else's. Right? What we feel matters nothing compared to what God thinks about His world. He is the definer of all things in it. And with this, how has God interpreted the cosmos? How has God interpreted it? Look at Colossians 1, 16 through 17. For by Christ all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether throne or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. What's God's interpretation of the universe? God has a Christ-centered interpretation of the universe. All of the universe exists. It, it, it exists through him and for him, and, and in him all things hold together. In the, in the matrix of Christ, the fabrics of the universe hold, hold together. Do you know what that means? The chair you're sitting in, the stage I'm standing on, far more fundamental than the elements, the 
hold it together, the electrons and the neutrons, far more foundational to any of that is Jesus. So, so that if the Son of God were to cease to exist, all of reality would cease to exist. Th- this gives us a Christ-centered interpretation of all of reality. It's not just revelation and scripture, but, but all of reality is, must be read and interpreted through a Christ-centered lens. What that means is we must think Christ-centered thoughts and submit all of our thoughts to Jesus Christ? Answer four. Christ, the covenant Lord. Christ, the covenant Lord. So so generally, the covenant with creation established in Genesis 1 and 2, which we'll talk more about in our hermeneutics and biblical theology class, or see also in Isaiah 24, 5. Okay. The earth lies defiled under its inhabitants, for they have transgressed the laws, violated the statutes, and broken the everlasting covenant. Right? This refers to some kind of covenant that all of the world has broken. That only makes sense if God has some kind of covenant with all of his creation in general. So specifically, though, with his covenant people, who he's enabled to fulfill the role of all creation, um, God has covenant relationship and, co- and gives them covenant knowledge. Okay? Consider Ezekiel 16.62. I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Knowledge of who God is is dependent upon the idea of covenant is what that means, okay? Knowledge of who God is exists in covenant, and, and covenant equals relationship. Within relationship with God, we know things about God, okay? So we could say in some sense our creator creature diagram is incomplete, So if we have God and we have creation, God in his kindness has created covenant. He's created relationship. He's created relationship that that apart from relationship, there is no knowledge that he is God. There is no knowledge that he is the Lord. And while there is a general covenant with all of creation, there's a specific covenant with God's people that, give, that gives a special knowledge of who God is. And that gets to the um, uh, number five, not the final, number five, Christ, God incarnate. Okay? What has God done in Christ? He's he's fulfilled what he said he would do in the Old Covenant. God's desire, Exodus Exodus 3, verse 12, God's desire is that he would dwell in the midst of his people. I will be with you. Exodus 3, verse 12. I will be be with you. Deuteronomy 4, verse 7. What great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord? The the hope of Israel was that God desired to dwell in her midst, which is ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Matthew 1, 23. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God with us. God, who has existed from eternity past, has come in the person of Christ. And and this person of Christ is the greatest of all of God's self-disclosures. Look at John 1, 14. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory as the glory of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Or consider Colossians 1.15. He is the image of the invisible God. 
the one around whom the whole cosmos was revolves, has come to earth, and he's spoken, contrasting philosophies of this world. Consider Colossians 2. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have, ha- I have had for you and for those in Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love to reach all the fullness of the full assurance of understanding in the knowledge of God, God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Where is knowledge found? In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That's a massive epistemological claim. Massive. So Jesus Christ is the one who reveals, and he's the content of what is revealed. Bavink again is helpful. He is the logos in an utterly unique sense, revealer and revelation simultaneously. All the revelations and words of God in nature, in history, in creation, and recreation, both in Old and New Testament, have their ground, unity, and center in Him. Let me give the last answer. Answer number six. Is God the Redeemer? God... God, in his acts of redemption, always acts to make himself known. God, in his acts of redemption, always acts to make himself known. So, Exodus 7, verse 5 is an example. God will bring his people out of Egypt, and then the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. Compare that to Exodus 14, verse 4. When God hardened Pharaoh's heart, so they will pursue them, and God will get his glory over Pharaoh, and then all the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. Or look at verse 18. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh. God acts redemptively for the purpose of making himself known. And God God acts redemptively for the purpose of making his will known as well. Ephesians 1, 7 through 10. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight, when he made known to us the mystery of his will. In redemption, God made something known. He made his will known to us. And and God acts redemptively so that he might be known by his people. So God is known, God is known in redemption. So that problem of sin ensnaring our minds, remember talking about that? Look at what happens in Romans 6, 14. Sin will no longer have dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. So within this idea of the creator-creature distinction, one more line to draw. Revelation. God has revealed himself. And he has made us willing to receive that revelation. Because while the mind that's set on the flesh is hostile to God and it cannot receive God's law, it cannot submit to God's law, God has freed us, Romans 6.14, so that sin will no longer have dominion over you. Consider Proverbs 1.11. Oh, sorry, Proverbs 1.7. The fear of the Lord 
is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Again, that's a massive epistemological claim, isn't it? Within our, within our ideas of how to know, where to find knowledge, this, this verse, Proverbs starts out with saying, fearing God, being in relationship with God, ultimately then being in relationship with God through Christ is where this is finally experienced and known, is the beginning of knowing anything. So, so that um, this fear of God, to put it in Augustinian terms, I believe that I might understand. The beginning of knowledge is fear of God, is faith in Christ. Now, when you say beginning, beginning can mean a number of things, right? Um, think about this analogy. You can, you can think of the beginning like the starting point of a race. You have the beginning line, right? So that if that's what we're, we're talking about here, it's the beginning of the you get past the fear of the Lord, and that's how you start your knowledge, right? That, that's one idea of beginning. Another idea of beginning, though, is like the ABCs. Like, you're learning your Greek alphabet right now. Why are you learning your Greek alphabet right now? Because it is the beginning of everything, right? And, and you will never move past the alphabet, right? The alphabet might take different forms when words are spelled differently, are you trying to parse your verbs and things like that? But you never move past it. I think the fear of the Lord, or you could say faith in Christ, is like the ABCs. It's the beginning of everything. The beginning of any true knowledge. So, so what can we say about our knowledge of God through Revelation? We can say two things. Number one, all knowledge of God is subject to what God has revealed. All knowledge of God is subject to reveal, to what God has revealed. It's servant knowledge, as John Frame says. We know what God has made known, and nothing more. This is true, both in what God has chosen to disclose in Scripture, and what He chooses to illuminate our minds through the Holy Spirit in the text of Scripture. So then all knowledge of God, all knowledge of God is in response to what God has chosen to reveal to us. So therefore, in all of our knowledge of God, in all of our knowledge of God, we are utterly dependent upon God himself. Okay, that is why God is the object of revelation. And that is why we have a Christ-centered, gospel-centered hermeneutic, Christ-centered, gospel-centered theology. God has chosen to reveal, and he has revealed the greatest thing possible, himself. God has chosen to reveal, and he has revealed the greatest thing possible, himself. And why? Why does God reveal? My goodness. He reveals to make friends with us. He reveals to make friends with us. Like Abraham, who was called a friend of God. Like Moses, who spoke to God face to face, he reveals for the purpose of making friends with us. He, his revelation is redemptive in nature to bring us out of sin, which ultimately, and the greatest expression of that is Christ himself. He reveals to make friends with us. Let's, let's move on to something that's a bit, a bit lighter and maybe a bit of a side note. We're, what, what naturally flows after this is our sources of theology, right? Um, so if God has revealed, right, if God has revealed, then in what ways has he revealed would be the na next natural question. Um, no, let's, let's move on to that. If God has revealed, what are the ways that he has revealed, okay? What are the ways that he has revealed? Uh, what are his modes of revelation, right, or how, right? How has God revealed himself? The purpose of revelation is relationship. The purpose of revelation is relationship. The purpose of revelation is redemption, okay? If, if you believe that, that radically shifts how you think about this book. It radically shifts how you think about reading this book in the morning for your devotions, right? 
It, it means this book is not just about a bunch of just random facts that it's good to know. The, the purpose of this book is to redeem you in Christ. That, that affects how you preach, even. That affects the questions you ask when you come to the text, right? But let's, let's ask this question. How does God reveal what are the modes of revelation with that? What are the sources of systematic theology? What are the sources of systematic theology? That's kind of the subset. The sources of systematic theology, right? If, if, <clears throat> if theology is about God and it's only known to us through revelation, then what are the sources of systematic theology? Talk about that in your groups. What are the sources of systematic theology? Try to come up with as many as you can that you think are accurate. What is the object of theology? God. Yeah, good. God. 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 And... Yeah, God's works in creation. Right? So we're studying God. And by virtue of studying God, we're studying God's works in creation. Okay? So maybe we could say, if this is you... Okay, and you're, you're trying to understand who God is. Um, what are the modes? What are, what are the sources of systematic theology, right? What are the modes that we use to do our systematic theology, or modes of revelation? Does that answer the question? What is this line? I guess that's what we're asking. What is this line? <laughs> right? Uh, how, how do we understand who God is, um, and then, in light of that, his works. <clears throat> okay, what do you think? What do you think? What are, our, what are our sources of systematic theology, or maybe modes of revelation? Any idea? Scripture, okay, the Bible. That's good. If you didn't say that first and foremost, we, we got some things we need to work on, right? So number one, the Bible. Good. The Bible. Let's look at 2 Timothy 3, 16. 2 Timothy 3, 16. All Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. Right? The Bible. The Bible first and foremost. Good. What else? Anything else? Or just the Bible? Nature. Nature. Okay. Where would you put that? Is it the same as the Bible? No. Okay. Where would you put that? Okay. Interesting. So maybe it's another category. I would do that too. So I would say there's primary... And there's secondary. Okay, and that's fine to put nature. So, um, Psalm 19. Okay, the heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech. Night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth. Good. What else? Christ himself? Yeah, I think so. I want to think about... That's a good answer. Um, I want to think about where to put that, how to categorize that. Let me think about that. Yes. Yes. Hebrews 1, right? Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophet, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, is how the ESV translate, but in huyo, in huyo, in a son kind of way, right? See, he's spoken, you, may, you don't know Greek yet, but do you see this in, uh, in, oops, if I can highlight it, right? In the prophets, right? In a prophet kind of way, but here in, in a son kind of way. He's, he's revealed in a 
new way in these last days, in a, in a sun kind of way. It's a, it's a quality of revelation, right? It's more explicitly Christ. Um, very good, yeah. I want to think more about where to put that in my diagram, though. Yeah, he's the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprints of his nature, and he upholds the universe by his power. Very good. You're exactly right. Good. What else? Any other modes of us doing systematic theology? Any other sources of systematic theology you can think of? Church tradition. Okay. Where would you put it? Secondary or primary? Secondary? You're worried. You're worried about me, aren't you? I can see it in your eyes. You're like, where is he going with this? I'd probably put it like right here. Okay. Um, yeah, like 1.5, exactly, yeah. Yeah, don't let anyone ever put you into a box, okay? Don't let anyone ever put you into a box. I'd probably put it right there, um, tr- the church. Right? What, what does Jesus say when the Holy Spirit comes? Uh, John sixteen thirteen. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will do it. We already looked at Ephesians 4, right? He's given the teachers, the prophets, the apostles, the evangelists for the building of the body of Christ until we reach unity of the faith, right? <clears throat> so there is a sense in which we can say the church. Very good. Anything else? Experience. Experience. Yeah. Experience is an interesting one, right? Experience is an interesting one because it doesn't really go in the category of revelation, does it? God doesn't reveal to us through our experiences, or does he? Does God reveal to us in our experiences? Why don't we leave experiences off here and we'll come back to it? Good. What else? Anything else? Yeah, th- I put that in the church. How about faith? Right, Babbing has a whole section on that. I think faith is a means by which we do systematic theology. But then what's its relationship to revelation? Is it the same as experience or no? These are interesting questions. But why don't, we, why don't we start talking about some of these modes, okay? And then we'll get to trying to fill out the puzzle a little bit. Um, I, I hope you see with this, it's not as easy as it is at first glance. Or even if we're going to talk about nature, I mean, am I, am I supposed to look at a lion eating a gazelle and from that derive something about God? Yes or no? Maybe. Maybe not. In what sense is that revelation? In what sense does that aid me in my systematic theology? These are not easy questions, okay? The easy one is the Bible. Everyone says that, but once you get into other categories, it's like, what, what are we actually talking about? Let's talk about the Bible. The Bible. The Bible is the principal and supreme for source of our theology. It's foundational. It's the standard. It is the final authority in all theology, never to be questioned. It is, as God has revealed to us, the primary standard of all theology. All of our thinking about God, all of our thinking about God's world, must go back to the Bible. End of story. Okay, there's no, no asterisk besides that. Um, revelation, as seen in this book, preserved for us in this book, is the final say in all theological discussions. Just think of Jesus himself. There's debates with religious leaders, and how do those debates end? It was written, end of debate. There's no debating 
after the Bible has spoken. Once the Bible is spoken, that's the end of the conversation. <laughs> Nothing else can be said. But why the Bible? Why the Bible? Right? There's more than one mode of revelation, so why are we choosing the Bible above others? Doesn't God reveal himself in many ways? Why the Bible and why not all revelation equally? Why the Bible supremely? Shouldn't all of God's modes of revelation be equally considered when we do our theology? Don't you think? And if not, we better have a good reason why. We better have a good reason why we choose the Bible as superior to church history, right? Why? Well, I'd like to give us two reasons. Number one is the Bible is redemptive, interpretive nature. Okay? The Bible is redemptive, interpretive nature. Okay? <clears throat> Short note on general revelation over special revelation, which we'll get to defining later. All of God's acts in creation are revelatory acts, right? But within those acts, some revelatory acts are especially intended to save God's people. Some accomplish the purpose of revelation more effectively than others. Uh, all revelatory acts accomplished by God in history, then, point to the Christ event. We call this redemptive history, right? Redemptive history is God's series of redemptive acts in history where he saves his people. God acts, God reveals himself for the purpose of saving his people. That's what redemptive history is. Um, but we don't, we do not base all of our theology even on all of God's special revelation. There's some special revelation that we don't base our theology on, right? The Bible stands as unique above all, even special revelation. It is the most unique of all of God's special revelatory acts. And at our stage of redemptive history, the Bible is written to give us authoritative interpretation of all of redemptive history. Okay, it is, it's the divine interpretation of all of God's special revelatory acts in history. It's the final say. It is written, and it's canonized, and it's preserved so that God's people might understand him and know him. In our stage of redemptive history, the Bible uniquely does that, right? Does that make sense? The, the Bible, then, is unique in God's eyes as well. He reveals in many ways, but through the Bible, he reveals to us the meaning of redemption, through the Bible, he reveals to us the meaning of the Christ event. Consider 1 Corinthians 18, or 1 Corinthians 1, 18. Our uh, cessationist brothers were really worried when I said 1 Corinthians 18, because there is no 1 Corinthians 18. Does Josh's Bible have more chapters in it? The words of the cross are folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it's written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and in the discernment of the discerning, I will thwart. Where's the wise one? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand a sign, Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified a stumbling box to the Jews, and folly to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you are wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful, not many were of noble birth. But God chose what's foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what's weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what's low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being may boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, so that it is written, let the one who boasts, boasts 
in the Lord. The meaning of all of God's revelatory events in history is the Christ event. It it all points to that. It's all about that. It's just a natural conclusion of what we've said about God's doctrine of revelation in general, right? That this redemption, then, is what we need to understand God's revelation rightly. Um, Consider Psalm 10, verse 4. In the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him. His thoughts are, there is no God. Right? So while, while the heavens declare the glory of God, Psalm 19, the wicked, his thoughts every day is, there is no God. So if we're even going to understand God's revelation rightly, we need to have this experience of the Christ event effect, made effective in our lives through God's special revelation. So that's number one, is the Bible's redemptive interpretive nature. It interprets for us the most climactic of all of God's saving purposes, his revelation in Christ, his salvation in Christ. Number two is the Bible's verbal nature. Okay? The Bible is verbal. The Bible is linguistic. And, and more than that, it's written revelation. Right? There are other verbal revelations of God that we have not been given access to, right? There are other verbal revelations of God that we have not been given access to. Just think, we don't even have all the words of Christ, right? There are things that God said that he chose to not put in this book. Which means, the fact that he wrote them down means they're special, (laughs) and we'll get to this when we get to our doctrine of the Bible, it means that he intends for these words of special revelation to be authoritative and preserved for all people of all time in a unique way, above and beyond even his other special revelatory moments. It can't be misheard. It can't be forgotten. It's the clearest act of God's special revelation. That's number two. Number three is the Bible's universally preserved nature. Okay? The Bible uniquely stands among all of God's preserved verbal special revelatory acts. Um, If God preserves his word for us, which he does, then we, we must discriminate among verbal revelations from God. To observe which ones he has preserved, right? Look at Matthew 5.18. I say to you, heaven and earth will pass away. Not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Nothing will be lost that God desires to preserve. Here's, Here's what that means. Let's say for a moment that Jesus is preaching in the Sermon on the Mount. And there's a shepherd boy there who's taking good sermon notes. Maybe we find that one day. And there's something in those sermon notes that we don't have in Matthew or Luke. Should that be added to the pages of Scripture? Absolutely not. Because God has not preserved that for His church universal, for the purpose of growing His church. There's a discrimination that God makes in his special revelation so that he preserves uniquely this book in a way that he has not preserved other verbal special revelation okay so we're we're not making a distinction god's made a distinction god himself has made a distinction fourthly and most importantly the bible's own claims Right. Let's go back to 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete. Right? The Bible uniquely is able to make you complete for every good work. The Bible uniquely is able to do that according to its own claims. 
which means the Bible has a special role in our theology. Does that make sense? Now, there is something that no one mentioned. There's something that no one mentioned. A mode of God's revelation. Can you think of what it might be? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, what I would put in primary. So, Bavink is helpful here. Bavink is very helpful here. So he differentiates between the principal word, which is Scripture, and the internal word. Okay? Scripture itself is self-authenticating as the Word of God, right? Right there. It's the Word of God. Can't argue with it. But there's an internal sense in which God confirms in his children, as they're reading these words, that they are the Word of God, and that's through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, right? So we don't just know that the Bible is the Word of God because it says it's the Word of God. We know the Bible is the Word of God also because the Holy Spirit tells us as we read it that these are his words. It's, it's like this, right? Imagine going to a play, a Shakespeare play, right? And, and it's one thing to just watch the play, and to make conclusions about what Shakespeare meant as you're watching it, it's another thing to have Shakespeare sitting right next to you and have him telling you what he meant as you're watching it. That's what the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit wrote this book, right? But as we're reading it, he is Shakespeare sitting next to us telling us what he means by it and confirming to us that these are indeed his words. Right? So we have this initially, um, we have this initially in salvation, right? We have this initially in salvation, this confirmation of the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 through 6. Which says this. In the case of the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel and the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is on ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. In salvation, God confirms that these are indeed his words. But there's an ongoing experience as well, in which the Holy Spirit continues to illuminate to us. Right? That's what theologians call this, is the illumination work of the Holy Spirit. Paul prays in Ephesians 1.17 that believers who have already received the Holy Spirit, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the Spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, so that you may know what is the hope to which He has called you, what are the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of His, greatness of his power towards us who believe. There's, there's a sense in which the Holy Spirit is continuing a confirmatory work in the hearts of believers. So, there's a, I want to make a distinction here, though. There's, there's the Spirit's attestation to Scripture as the Word of God, both in Scripture, so the Holy Spirit speaks in this book to say that these are the words of God, and He confirms it in our hearts that these are indeed the words of God. So it's inspiration and illumination. He inspires the text, and He illumines the text. So there's more on this later when we develop our doctrine of Scripture. But God is both the author of Revelation and the confirmer of Revelation. In this sense, the Holy Spirit is working objectively in these words, but he's also working subjectively when he confirms that these are indeed the words of God in our hearts as we read them. Um, so we have an internal witness as well as an external witness. Does that answer your question? Great. Yeah, because our God, who is transcendent, has come to be with us. That, that's a glorious thing, isn't it? it, it God has not remained distant from us. Like, that's, that's one of the most beautiful things in Revelation, is that you have these special revelatory moments throughout Scripture, right, where, where God appears in the burning bush, or His finger writes something, or, or, or people see Him as a fourth man in the fire, right? That God is continually revealing in ways that brings Himself close to people. So, in the Old Testament, we see it in several ways, but in the New Testament, it really becomes clear. Christ Himself is God with us, 
Uh, Jesus says he will send to us the Holy Spirit. Jesus says he'll be with us into the end of the age. And so there's this, there's this wonderful complexity to it in that he's not just given us a book and said good luck, but he's, he's with us as we're reading it. Does that make sense? But I do, I do think that it's, it's one of the glories and the unique things of Christianity, right? So, so we're not Kantian. We're not Kantian. We don't, we don't think that God has given us our sense perception and somehow we have this special, or modified Kantianism, <laughs> somehow we have this special book and God reveals to us in it. But besides that, he's the distant God off in heaven somewhere. Um, he's actually in the room as we read it. And he's not only in the room as we read it in a way that confirms in our hearts that these are the words of God, but he, he's in the room as we read it causing us to cry out, Abba, Father. He's in the room as we read it convicting us of sin. He's in the room as we read it reminding us of what he's done in Christ. So he's actually present with us, right? Um, you could distance that from God to say the ministry of God in the Holy Spirit, maybe. Maybe that's more precise, but it's a, it's a good question. What's the role of faith? So, Holy Spirit. Um, the role of faith. I think faith is the channel through which we receive this revelation of God. Okay? It's the channel through which we receive this revelation of God. Uh, Hebrews 11.1, 1, once again. Um, Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things that are not seen. Sorry, verse 6, here we go. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. Whoever would draw near to God, let's say draw near to God in doing systematic theology, must believe that he exists, and that he's a rewarder of those who seek him. And that faith is maybe the hose through which we receive that revelation, and it becomes effective. Now, that faith itself, of course, we would say is a gift of God. It's not as if we create this faith so that God can speak to us. No, rather, faith as a gift from God is the means by which God makes that revelation effective. Consider Romans 8, 24. For in this hope we are saved. Now, hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes in what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience, right? We have this hope. This hope is forward-focused faith, right? That we experience as we await the return of Christ. Or consider 2 Corinthians 5, 7. We walk by faith and not by sight. So, so even those who saw Christ needed faith, Right? There are people who saw Christ who didn't have faith, who didn't, they didn't follow him, right? Faith, then, is the means by which we receive revelation from God. Truth is revealed through faith, and we believe that we might understand, right? That's Augustine. We believe that we might understand. Therefore, faith is a receptive posture. Faith is a receptive posture that what these words are, I will believe them. Now, let me be clear, this faith is sourced in God himself, Hebrews 12, 2. How do we have faith? We look to Jesus, the one who founded our faith. Okay? It's not something we muster up in ourselves. It's something that God gives to us so that we can receive what he has to say. Baving says this, The heart is as good for the perception of truth as the head. So Baving says, Faith, with its grounds, has as much validity as science with its proof. Despite all the argumentation, faith maintains itself and says, I cannot do otherwise, so help me God. That's reform cessationist who says that. So faith is the means by which we receive God's revelation, and God makes that revelation effective in our lives. But it's also what God gives us so that we can't even receive it in the first place. Good. 